Anybody else have a busy week this week? I don't, it seemed like everybody I talked to felt like they were just, just staying ahead of the curve this week. It's just, it was very, very busy. I think this is a time of transition. Don't you feel that as the kids start to go back to school, there's harvest happening, there's all sorts of things happening. People's lives are kind of trying to find that new schedule right now. Have you guys felt that? I know I sure have. I've been feeling that just trying to get back into finding out that routine, that summer routine just doesn't want to let go. And, uh, and I'm trying to find my routine again. And it's good um, to see that uh, you, the people that are here today, are making a commitment to be here at church because this should be part of our routine. This should be part of what we do. And it's good because what we do is remember here in a place like this, we kind of remember to thank God for the good things that have happened this week. But when we come here, we also remember to offer up our concerns for the coming week. This is a great place for us to center our lives. I would say that this day, this Sunday, in this sanctuary, is a place to root your life. To be able to help, help it find a purpose, to help it find meaning, to remind yourselves of what is most important um, in what we do as Christians, as disciples. So we're going to be coming into the Word again, uh, into the book of Matthew. We looked at the book of Matthew, we looked at uh, the Beatitudes last week, and I said, uh, Are You Happy? was the title of the sermon, and we were looking at what does it mean to be a happy disciple? How do we get to be happy disciples? Well, that was part one, and we only, because we only got through uh, just a few verses. Can you imagine if I preached all the Beatitudes all at once? We'd be here for a really long time, because that was a uh, good long sermon. Well, we're, I, I was wise and divided up into two pieces. So we're at part two uh, today um, of this sermon. So we're going to be continuing on with the, the Beatitudes. And um, we're going to be starting at verse verse 7, okay? And so we've got these first ones. We're not going to go all the way to verse 12 like I thought. We're actually just going to go down to the end of verse 10. So just verses 7 to 10 we're going to focus on. Let's read them. Blessed are the merciful... For they will be shown mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. The word of the Lord. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we come to your uh, word, Lord, as, as people who are very busy, as, as lives that seem to be taking a whole lot of different directions and a lot of these directions take us away from the most important thing, focusing in on you. And Lord, we come today because we want to be good disciples. We want to be happy disciples. We want to be people that are congratulated because of our position in our relationship with you. And so Lord, we come looking for a little bit of wisdom, a little bit of knowledge, a little bit of way of how we can maybe make some shifts in our lives so that we can live in the business world, in our family world, in the church world, in the school, Lord, as disciples of your Son, Jesus. So pray, Lord, that you would be with us. Open the word to us now. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, when uh, we see uh, Christians on the news, or when people make caricatures of Christians, what are some of the things that, that usually come out? What are the things that uh, people say, or what, what are some of the things that the cartoons of Christians, uh, what, what, what are they usually of? Anybody got some ideas? Intolerance. Intolerance, yeah. That is, the caricature of them, would they be intolerant? Anything else? Nothing else. Okay, well, I've got lots. Um, no, the, the, the reality is when we see these cartoons, usually, I think intolerance is probably the main one, or some version of that, right? It's usually, um, there's actually an interesting one, and ever, anybody ever heard of Alice Monroe? Um, she, wrote, she wrote this book called uh, uh, Of Girls and Women. Have you heard of it? Is that any good? Okay. There's an interesting part in that book where um, the, her, her boyfriend has become a Christian, and he thinks that everybody should be Christians. And, so, and he thinks that everybody should be baptized. And so what he does is he takes her out to this river. And he's trying to tell her that she needs to become a Christian. And she needs to be baptized. Well, they go into the river. And he grabs her and pushes her under the water. She doesn't want to be. She, he forcefully push, pushes her under the water and pulls her out. There is a, very, uh, there is a version or a caricature 
that people often use of Christians. They try to force people into doing that. There is one example of that. The words used to define Christians in the caricature cases are almost always negative. I remember in my last year of high school, though, when I was passionately following the Lord and acting as an evangelist to my school, that I would get called names and be criticized for my beliefs. Now, the school that I went to, um, there weren't as many Christians are there as there are in our school here. Uh, I was in the city, and it was, uh, it was not a very Christian place, so I got made fun of quite a bit. While I had times of success in sharing the gospel, I had opportunities to share the gospel in many places. I also got called names. I remember being called one time a Bible thumper. And that was my first time of getting that one. And uh, but that's, a one, that's what people use. People will use names as a way of kind of uh, breaking people down. I said, I'm not a Bible thumper, I'm a Bible believer. But um, some negative words and phrases, unfortunately, probably do describe some Christians. Have you guys met Christians that you go, man, I don't really want to be associated with that person. You see these people on the news and you're like, eek. Those Christians, those are, those, are, those are the crazy kooks. And uh, the majority of Christians, though, I find are better, uh, better characterized by attributes such as caring, um, giving, peaceable. Most Christians, I find, that I meet, just the regular, everyday Christians are good people, caring people. And in fact, Jesus in his Sermon on the Mount tells us some of the things that should characterize Christians. And that doing these things leads to a blessed or happy life. Last week, we talked a little bit about that word, happy. We learned that in the Greek, the word for happy, does anybody remember it? You guys all know Greek now? What was that word? It was makarios. Do you remember that? That's the Greek word for happy or blessed. We often translate it in older versions of the Bible. We translate it as blessed. Now, we also learned that this word happy should not be understood as the emotion of happy. When we translate verse 7, we should not think... Uh, or we, that this means happy is and I feel great or elated when I'm merciful. In fact, the reality is when you're being merciful, you might not feel good at all. When you're doing what's right, it may not feel good. It may feel bad, but rather when you are makarios or happy or blessed, you are to be commended or congratulated because what you're doing is in putting you in good relationship with God. That's why you're happy. It's a happy situation. Last week we learned that as disciples of Jesus, we are happy when we are first poor in spirit, when we're comforted in our mourning, when we are meek, when we hunger and thirst for righteousness. Now to this list, let us then add a few other activities that we must engage in to be happy disciples. Do you guys all want to be in a good relationship with God? That's what this is all about. If you want to be in a good relationship with God, one that is happy, one that other people look and go, wow, that person is just so connected in with God. Do these things. It's not hard. He doesn't say, I might, you might be blessed or you might be happy if you do this. He's saying you will be if you do these things. It's a simple, it's a simple equation, really. This will happen. So let's look at these things. Verse 7 begins with this phrase, uh, blessed or happy are the merciful. Now, has anybody ever had a mercy fight before? Does anybody, does anybody know about mercy fights? Maybe you guys, uh, maybe you guys didn't do these things. It's where you lock hands. I only do this as a teenager, right? You don't do this. You don't do this when you get older. But mercy fights. You lock hands together with another person, and then what you try to do is bend the other hand, the guy's hands backwards, or you try to crush his fingers until he says, "Mercy." Right, he gives up, right? So uh, the problem with that game is that whether you win or lose, your hands really hurt. Uh, but in this fight, you're trying to get this other person to say mercy. Then, then in wartime, uh, think about during a wartime, if all of a sudden uh, there's two sides battling it out and one realizes the other is much stronger than the other, uh, the other's team is stronger than them or they're fighting against, they might give up. And if they're going to give up, what do they do? They want to show that they're giving up. They wave something. They wave the white flag, right? They wave that white flag and they give up. They ask for mercy. In these ways, it's always the loser who's crying out for mercy. It is forced on them by the strength or aggression of the other team or other person. It's the weak giving in to the strong. For the happy disciple, they are to be not interested in demonstrating strength or making another give in or submit to them or to their proposal or to their rule or to their dominant power. 
Instead, the merciful are the ones who give in to the weak. This is, this is a total reversal here. For the happy disciple, the strong one, gives in to the weak. So a simple example of this is the dad who's wrestling his son. Now most dads will give in, right? You, know, you don't see dads like pummeling their children. Ah, oh, you know, I body slammed you. Well, some dads do. But some, you know, uh, you don't see dad trying to demonstrate his power, his strength. He knows he's stronger, right? So what does he do? He gives in to his kids, right? All of a sudden, so there's this hulking man on the floor and this little 30-pound uh, 30, 30 child is able to all of a sudden turn this dad over and is laying on top and has won, has defeated his father in a, in a battle, a match, right? Because the dad knows he's stronger. It doesn't matter. He gives in. And he lets the son, the other son or his daughter win. The child actually has to egg on or cajole the parent to try harder. In the same way, in business, there are people that maybe cross your path that are in desperate straits or are losing everything and just trying to get out of the business with some integrity. Now, you know you could take them out for an uh, you know, absurdly low price because they're desperate. You could buy that company for an absurdly low price. They're desperate to get out. But a merciful disciple who's also a businessman, for instance, We'll look to make a fair deal where there's a win on both sides, where the attitude in negotiations isn't predatory, but merciful. And this goes, this goes for everything. And, and even if you're, I'm making, I'm using something like business, but it could just go in your own purchases when you're buying something off of Kijiji or something like that. You get to the home and you find that somebody's desperately trying to get rid of all of their things because something really bad has happened in their lives. And they've got no opportunities, no freedom. Uh, they've got to get rid of everything. And this is a last-ditch effort. Now, you know you could take them for the lowest price. But that's not, that's not the job of a merciful disciple. A merciful disciple, a happy disciple, is one who says, I see this situation, and while I know I could do more, I'm in the strong position, I'm actually going to be merciful. I'm actually going to negotiate to raise the price. Because I want to show mercy. And this is the way that I do it. The way that I do it is I'm looking for the win on both sides. I'm not saying that you don't, you don't get an advantage from doing what you're doing. That you're not looking to you know, lose money. But at the same time, what you're trying to do is to look for a win on both sides. Where both people are coming out. Rather than you dominating the other person. Now why should we be merciful like that? Why should we be merciful like that? What kind of reason could we find in the scriptures that would guide us to this application of mercy when we don't even need to offer it? Is it not Matthew 18.33 where Jesus says, And should you not have mercy on your fellow servant as I had mercy on you? And when we apply this to ourselves and to our, our world and our lives, we see that of course God has forgiven us so much. God has poured out an abundance of mercy upon us. Before we cried out for help and mercy from God, God made a transaction on our behalf for our release from our debt. We were in debt. We should pay it. It was, ours to, it was ours to pay. And he steps in when he is strong and we are weak. And he negotiates on our behalf. Remember I was saying like that business person negotiating on the behalf of the weak person. Does that, can you see where that just doesn't make sense in our world? But it should for us Christians. Because that's what he did. He negotiated on our behalf while we were weak, when we were in the bad position, and said, no, 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 I know what you had to pay, but I'm going to actually fix this for you so that it's better for you. This is what God does. And Jesus says, use this as a way to see others who require mercy from you. Use the mercy you have been shown as a filter so you're going to view other situations in your life where you have the strength and power to deal mercifully when we give mercy, it honors God and God blesses us. How does he bless us? Well, of course, his mercy is most clearly evident at our future judgment. When even though we sin, Jesus covers us in his righteousness. God is a merciful God and all mercy originates in him. Then in verse 8, Jesus says that the blessed or happy disciple is one who is pure in heart. Now, I read that phrase, pure in heart. I think of that praise song, Refiner's Fire. It's the first, the first thought that comes to my mind when I see the pure in heart. I think of that praise song that says, it's, it's a call, right, to God. Purify my heart. Purify my heart. 
to call for God to do something, to do this purity work. This is right thinking, this part of the song, because while we in ourselves cannot purify nor keep pure in our own power, we can't do it in our own power. We can't be pure. Instead, in our power, what do we do? I, I know what we all have the power to do. We have the power to sin. We have the power to follow, follow our own path. That's what happens in our power. But in the power of God, which is given to us at conversion, now we can start following God. We can start doing good things, but we still need His power to help us do it. So purity is important, but we know we're going to need help. I think there's some good wisdom in the Psalms, particularly Psalm 24, verses 3 to 4, about this issue. Who shall ascend the hill of the Lord? Who shall stand in His holy place? He who has clean hands and a pure heart, who does not lift up his soul to what is false and does not swear deceitfully. Well, if that's the requirements of going up the hill of the Lord, ascending the hill of the Lord, I am at the back of the line. Because that's not me. Uh, pure hands, right, uh, clean heart, pure heart, that's not me. The only one who can do that is Jesus. He's the only one that can ascend the hill of the Lord, can meet with the Father face to face. We instead are more like Isaiah. Tell me if this doesn't resonate with more how you feel. Woe is me, for I am lost. For I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. That's how I feel sometimes. That's more what I feel. So we need to have pure hearts, but it's only going to happen. We can only ascend the hill of the Lord through Jesus. But what does this mean? What is the heart after all? I, I, I read this phrase, pure in heart, and we just kind of skim over it and go, yeah, yeah, we all know what he means. But I look at it and I say practically, if somebody was just reading this for the free, first time, they go, pure in heart? Isn't the heart just an organ that our, uh, in our bodies that pumps blood? So they're saying that this organ needs to be pure or impure? Now you all know, I'm sure, that the heart organ is not the location of purity or impurity. And Jesus knew this as well. So why does Jesus talk about the heart as being pure? Well, the simple answer is that Jesus is engaging the culture of his time in its particular understanding about the person. For the people in Jesus' time, the heart was the location of being, the location of will, the location of decision-making. This was where things happened. Where would we locate that today? Where would you locate all those things? In the mind, right. So their idea was is that there was this, this place in your body, your heart, and that was where all that stuff came from. In close, close examination then, we see that the heart is like our modern day mind. It's the inner dimension, the seat of emotions, the will and the intellect, and therefore the place of impurity or purity. And, most, uh, and maybe most importantly, it's the place where the divine is encountered. The heart is where we come to know and love God, and therefore, much of our Christian talk centers around the heart. But we need, to, we need to always remember, when we're saying the heart, what we're talking about is the mind, not the brain. The brain and the mind are two separate things, we won't get into that. But the mind, that place of will, that place of thinking, that place of decision making, that's the part that needs to be reformed by Christ. That's the part where we need uh, Jesus to have full authority in our Christian life. It's in our minds so that he can guide our thoughts, our emotions, will, and intellect. So what does pure in heart mean? It means that we are to be holistic in our approach to purity in our lives. That we keep our mind, soul, body, life free from the contamination of sin. We avoid impure thoughts and the results that come from them. We are clear about who we are, both our failures and our successes. The pure in heart are growing in their desire to please God above all else. And the result is nothing less than astounding. Look with me at the end of verse 8. Disciples who are pure in heart by the grace and power of God will see God. Will see God. Now if I remember back to Moses' time, what happened, what would happen if Moses had seen God's face? Do you remember? Anybody? Sunday school? He would die. Right? So what did, Jim, what did God do? It says he turned his back, right? And he was seen, but he was seen from behind, rather than face to face. And then think of John. Think of John. Think of the book of Revelation. Read right the book, uh, the beginning of the book of Revelation. The risen Christ in his glory is seen by John. What does John do? Does John go, hey, good to see you. Welcome here. Shake his hand. 
No, what does he do? He falls down on his face as one dead. It says, because to see God is to know God. You see, the, the difference between, in many ways, between humans and God is that God, in his presence, there's no deception. In us, there's a difference between the face that we put on, that we show the world often, and what's happening inside. But to see God is to see, to see God visually. Because the God is the same in all places and all times with no deception, is to know God. On earth, this can't happen without death. But when we enter into eternity, we will see God not because we're pure in ourselves, but because of the purity of Jesus in us. Isn't that wonderful? That we're going to see Him face to face? That we're going to know Him? That is the greatest part about going to heaven, is that we will be with God and we will see Him face to face. Verse 9 says, Happy are the peacemakers. Now, peace, as you all know, is a substantial issue for our denomination. So for me to speak on this issue of peace is a big deal because I have not had those ideals taught and ingrained in me, and my, I may wrestle with them a bit more than you do. Uh, they are challenging for me because I have a natural inclination to fight. Now, there are other people in this group that I know have that inclination as well. No. No, there's, there's no other competitive people here that, you know, when, you know, gloves have never come off from anybody who plays hockey in this group, right? No gloves have ever come off, right? Because we're peacemakers, right? There should never be fights. In men, when men like to play hockey, there should never, gloves should never come off. They should just always, yeah. Well, we'll just keep going on here. Um, so some of you guys are like that as well, right? Uh, when we get pushed, what do we do? We push back. And when um, someone hurts us, what do we do? We hurt back. Now that being said, even though that is the case for me and some of my struggles, uh, my more recent experiences have taught me that peace is the right and first and foremost way of being a Christian. Now I know the issue of peace always seems to go to that war issue first, or theories of war. But I think it's completely wrong. When taking a biblical peace, uh, talking of biblical peace, Christian peace, we must first start with our personal and communal and family relationships right here in the church. Peace is first and foremost a way of being a disciple of Jesus. Jesus was the Prince of Peace. Wouldn't it be wonderful if the best living example of peace in our world was the Christian church and the way that they treated one another? That it was a place of peace. The people could come into our churches and know that they were entering into a safe and peace-loving environment where they could find healing from the pain and the aggression and the anger that is outside the world, in the world. But we do have to be careful to define our terms here as to what peacemaker means. It's peacemaker, not even peacekeeper, not even pacifist, not... Um, no, what is the other word? Uh, uh, person of non-resistance. It's peacemaker. Wow. Okay, start thinking about that. You guys are, I can see the, the wheels turning. Think about peacemaker. What does that mean? Peacemakers aren't about not responding to violent actions, but rather going out of their way and making peace. Bringing it about. James 3.18 says this about peacemakers. And a harvest of righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. What does it mean to make peace but to seek forgiveness, to seek reconciliation within ours and others' broken relationships? We have seen through many examples, even with those close to us, that peace is a foreign concept to humanity. The hope of Jesus is that through the intervention of Christian disciples, when wisdom speak into lives, that peace can be restored in relationships. Sometimes, though, this means tough talk. You know, people, people want to pander to people that are um, hurting other people. They don't want to make peace. They don't want to get involved. I'm telling you, if there's a broken relationship in a marriage, if there's difficulties in marriage, sometimes the thing that needs to happen is some real tough talk. We need to go to some of those guys that are not doing their job and say, buck up, buddy. Start carrying your load. Well, she did this and she did that and she says this. Okay, so she's 90% wrong? Yes. Well, I want to talk about your 10%. Let's work on that. 
Let's focus in on what you can do. And you know what? Guys don't want to hear that. They hate hearing that, that they're responsible for what they need, the peace they've got. You know what? Ladies are the same way. They want to be able to blame their husbands for the things that are going wrong in their relationships rather than taking a piece of it themselves and saying, I want to own that. But peacemaking in that situation where there's a problem requires somebody that's going to be loving and caring and peaceable, yes, looking for reconciliation. But we are being peacemakers, which means doing the hard thing, speaking the tough words in love and in care and gently, but still not, not avoiding them. So peace isn't something that's easy to make. But for those who persist in peacemaking, they are called, at the end of verse 9, children of God. Now when it says called children of God, it doesn't mean in name only. For instance, my children uh, have a, a good friend, uh, a really good friend, and they might call that friend uncle or aunt. So does anybody here have somebody that's connected to their family um, that is just a friend but is such a close friend that even your children use our, an honorary an honorary title like uncle or aunt? Does anybody do that? Yes, I see a bunch of uh, heads nodding. Okay, so that isn't a fact. It's not a fact that they're an uncle or an aunt. But we, we, we treat them as family because they're so close. But there's a difference here with God. When God uh, says something is the case, his very saying it makes it so. Remember his word is what created earth, moon, skies, animal plants, all things on earth? And how did he do it? How did he bring it into reality? By calling it so. And by calling it so, it was so. Peacemakers are called children of God. And the minute God calls you a child, you are a child. You are his child. Because he says so. Peacemakers can work effectively, can't work effectively, though, till he or she themselves are at peace with God. Those at peace with God, those who live out a peacemaking life, are called children of God. They are children of God, not just for a day, but for all eternity. Verse 10. Verse 10 says, happy are those who are persecuted because of righteousness. Don't you guys just shake your head at this one? How often does anyone in any other environment talk about persecution as a good thing? I think we can safely say, never. Humans are not wired to think of persecution as good. Even in the Old Testament, you do not see the idea that in any way that the persecution that they're undergoing is a good thing. Is actually a blessed thing. If anything, it was a sign of judgment. Yet within Christian, the Christian world, persecution actually, for righteousness' sake, is actually considered a good thing. And, made, and a happy state of affairs. Maybe you've experienced being made fun of because you remember God at work by praying over your lunch. Maybe when you take time to hang out with the unpopular, help the down and out, because of Christ, you're called a do-gooder. Maybe these kinds of things that you do, these righteous acts you perform because of God's love for you, cause others to make fun of you, persecute you even. But remember this most important truth, that when you act as a Christian person, you are not persecuted or hated because of yourself, but of who you represent. Your righteous acts are a challenge to, um, to live like Jesus. They, you, when you act like Jesus to the world, the world actually sees that and feels criticism in that. Because they're feeling a call by God to live by your example, by what you're doing. Your very doing good is a testimony against them. And it hurts. And it, it needles them. And it bothers them. Because they see this as a call then to be like you. And to be like you means to accept Christ. Your righteous acts are a challenge to the world that is far from Jesus. But persecution for righteous living is a New Testament ideal. To be persecuted because of Jesus is a feature of a happy disciple. Now this state of affairs, or this happy state, is not of course because of persecution itself. But because as it says in the rest of verse 10, those who are persecuted, persecuted for righteous living have the kingdom of heaven. Do you guys notice something about that phrase, kingdom of heaven? Have we seen that before? Yes, it was very, it's very beginning. Right? The kingdom of heaven came to those in verse 3 as well. What you see here is Jesus doing a great sermon. A great sermon is often one that takes the introduction and reminds you of the main point at the very end. And you see the bookends there? Kingdom of God, kingdom of God. It also highlights the important point. It highlights what we need to remember. 
It highlights the framework for Christians. What is supposed to be the framework of your life? The coming kingdom of God. What is supposed to be the framework of your life? The kingdom of God and making it present in this world today. That should define you. Brothers and sisters, we are to be so defined by this crazy, wonderful hope and knowledge of a future with the triune God that it infects everything we do. It affects everything we do. We are in this blessed state of affairs because we know that no matter what happens in this present world or in the future, that uh, future that we are going to one day be fully experiencing the joy of being disciples, not in a foreign land as we are today, but in our true home, the kingdom of God, where our God reigns completely and fully, not only in the space around us, but in us as well. People, the Beatitudes should have a huge impact on the way that you live. If it's not, don't just leave here and forget these things. These are things for you to try to practically work into your life. Jesus himself is calling you to do this. Is to live these things out in your world. We are so rich in many things in Canada. And because of that, we begin to trust in them. What we need to do is intentionally seek the things that make for happy disciples. So let's ask some tough questions. I'm going to ask you some tough questions because hopefully this will lead you to be thinking about how you can apply these in your lives. Are you merciful to those you're living with? Are you merciful to your family? Are you merciful to your husband? Are you merciful to your wife? When your wife or husband or child is having a bad day, when they're stressed out because of school or because of work or because of sickness or because of a death in the family or because of something else, are you offering them mercy when they make mistakes, when they blow up, when they're a little stressed out, when they do things wrong? Are you offering that mercy or are you kind of grinding it into them, reminding them of how they screwed up and they made mistakes and hey, you were yelling at me, so using it for justification for the actions you do? Are you saying, hey, I understand. You, what, you know what? I'm, not, I'm just going to love you. Not because you earned it. You did. You screwed up. You've been nasty to me. You did not earn this. But I offer it to you anyway. Because I'm attempting to be merciful. Because when I was making God angry, when God saw my sin, and he saw the, the awfulness of it, he had mercy on me. And so I'm going to... Because we can have mercy on people out there, but it's so hard to have in our families. Are you intentional about being pure in heart? Guys, we have to avoid things that pollute our minds. I feel like in the Christian church in North America, we try to get away with as much evil as we can. Let's watch a show. We're going to watch a movie because it's, it's not that bad. Now, I wouldn't watch it in church, right? But I'm going to watch it at home because I want to get as close to that place where it's, I know it's sin. I get as close as I can to that. The pure in heart don't ask, how close can I get to that line? They ask, what things are beneficial and are growing me up in the Lord? I'm going to watch such things. Now, some things are just simple entertainment. And those are good, too. We do need a break. And I'm okay with that. I'm not suggesting that there's a problem with that. But we have to be careful not to try to edge the line, but to try to stay in a healthy environment, a wholesome environment, where we're encouraging a pure, a pure mind. Are you being a peacemaker? When you see someone being hurt or pushed down or bullied, you need to get involved. If you see it at work, yeah, it's going to suck. This isn't going to be fun. I'm not, at no point am I trying to tell you this is going to be fun. But you need to get involved. You see somebody being hurt, bullied, pushed down, pushed around, hurt at church, if you see this, you need to get involved. You can't just pretend that you don't see it. You need to get involved and you need to make peace. You need to try to help the situation along. Don't just avoid conflict. Here is the thing. Doing the Beatitudes is not going to make your life easier. It comes with a price. And the price will maybe just be a disruption in your life. You will be persecuted, in, in fact, for doing these things. But doing these things also comes with a promise. You will be a happy disciple. Happy because even now you're participating in the eternal kingdom of God. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you so much for the work that you are doing in our hearts, that you are bringing us to being happy disciples. Lord, I just pray that you would guide us. Let us not forget these things. 
Let us try to find ways of instituting them and living them out in our own world. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.